Are we ready? Are we recording? Are we good? Okay, I will call the January 10th, 2024 meeting of the Manitou Springs Planning Commission to order. Call the roll. Commissioner Graybell? Present. Commissioner Wilson? Present. Commissioner Day? Present. Commissioner Storm? Present. Commissioner Latimer? Present. Commissioner Armstrong? Here. And I am Chair Delwich. And um, with that, we'll start. First item would be um, any um, non-agenda item discussion. If anybody in the audience would like to discuss an item that's not on the agenda, this would be the time to do it. Okay, and seeing no takers, we'll move on to um, next item is approval of the minutes of the September 13th, 2023 meeting. I have a motion to approve or any updates or motion to approve. I'll second that. Okay, and all those in favor of the motion? Okay, and I think there were two abstentions. Oh, so motion carries five zero with two abstentions. And we'll move on to our business meeting and I'll just describe the process for those who haven't been to a meeting. I'll call an item for discussion and um, planning department will, the planning staff will describe what the request was and what their analysis and findings are, any recommendations they have. Uh, following that, we'll uh, have the applicant state their case and give any information they want. And following that, we'll open the hearing to the public and anybody in the public, either physically here or online, will have an opportunity to state their thoughts on the issue. And um, following that, we'll deliberate and um, vote either to approve, deny, possibly table an item if we need more information. And with that, are there any um, conflicts or ex parte contacts to disclose? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move to the first item of uh, business. It's a short-term rental, 2308, uh, 2023. Ruxton Avenue, Patrick O'Neill, owner. Thank you, Chair Delwich. Uh, for the record, Chelsea Royston, senior planner. Uh, so as you stated, this is a request for short-term rental at 223 Ruxton. Um, the applicant is requesting a short-term rental permit to operate a vacation rental uh, for one bedroom rental with a maximum occupancy of two visitors. On the screen here, you can see our uh, short-term rental eligibility map. It's a little difficult to understand. The green areas are actually ineligible. Um, here, you can see a tiny blue speck, and that is 223 Ruxton, showing that it is eligible. It, uh, we believe, is the last remaining property that is eligible on Ruxton. Um, uh, so they do maintain a 500-foot buffer from any existing short-term rental permits. Uh, just some other information about short-term rental permits. Uh, they do require a business license uh, upon approval of um, the STR permit. Uh, we will have inspection for life safety. Uh, the business license and short-term rental permit are uh, valid for one year from the date of issuance and must be renewed annually. Um, and then uh, we do have uh, owner acknowledgements that uh, acknowledge several items found in code um, that kind of define the guidelines by which we require short-term rentals to be operated. Uh, the owner has agreed to those terms. As I stated before, the short-term rental permit uh, requested is for one uh, one bedroom with a maximum occupancy of two persons. Uh, 
they have one parking space would be required as one space is required for each of the first two bedrooms. This only has one bedroom, therefore one space is required. Uh, they do have one off-street parking space provided in an attached garage. The zone is general residential. Here you can see a couple photos from street view of the property. Um, along Ruxton, it has a zero foot setback. You can see the uh, attached garage there. And the house is developed in such a way that the garage is situated kind of under the main living areas. Here's a site plan, um, again, showing our zone district. Uh, the majority of the property is to the rear of the building. Um, it is undeveloped for the most part. I've highlighted the footprint of the building in green on the site plan, uh, just for clarity. There are no dimensional changes or anything like that proposed at this time. Here are our floor plans. Um, again, showing that one car garage um, with some storage areas and then uh, sorry, one car garage with storage areas, and then main living space with bedrooms on the third floor. Uh, I will note that the house does have two bedrooms. However, based on the available parking, the applicant has a, uh, proposed to restrict uh, residency to two visitors in order to comply with the guidelines required for short-term rentals. Um, the owner, Patrick O'Neill, acknowledges the short-term rental permit applica uh, applicability checklist, as well as uh, he assigned the primary residence affidavit and acknowledges owner occupancy uh, must be maintained for 185 days each year. Um, he does intend to operate the short-term rental uh, while he is out of town. Uh, he runs a seasonal business in Alaska and he has contracted with a local uh, property management uh, professional to oversee the, the rental uh, in his absence. Uh, however, in the uh, property notice uh, that is required, he has listed his uh, contact information as well as his um, property manager's contact information. Uh, we did receive one written comment as of this hearing. Uh, it is included in the meeting materials and is supportive of the application. Here we have our approval criteria that the short-term rental does not adversely impact the surrounding uses and that short-term rental does not encroach upon traditional neighborhood characteristics. Uh, should the Planning Commission find it appropriate to approve short-term rental 2308, staff does not recommend any conditions. And this concludes my presentation. Any questions for staff? So the requirement that, well, the, the limitation that there will only be rented to two people, what about a family with two kids that could use this other room but not have a second car. Is that allowable according to the code? Uh, so the code is silent on that. And the owner did bring that up. He also brought up the possibility that, um, you know, two businessmen could rent it and drive together. And uh, there's no way for us to really regulate that. So um, the code indicates that it is an occupancy based on bedrooms at two persons per bedroom. And that parking is uh, regulated based on the number of bedrooms being rented. So that's kind of how we got our calculations, um, if that answers your question. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, would the applicant uh, step to the table and... Uh... You can state your name and address for the record. And you just have to push the little speaker button there and be about three. No, just push it. It'll turn green. Okay. And then just keep it about three inches from your mouth. And that'll, it'll, we'll get it recorded. We, we need to have a record of it. So, All right. my name is Patrick O'Neill and I'm at 223 Ruxton Avenue, Manitou Springs, Colorado 80829. 
Okay. So you have the floor now to say whatever you want to add anything or embellish or explain anything. Um, I moved to Manitou about three years ago. I've always loved Manitou. I'm from Alaska. Um, I'm a commercial fisherman up there. I own a, a fishing boat and and a little fishing business. So I'm absent for basically June and July, sometimes May. I, um, I'm a single man. I have one car and um, great location, I thought, and maybe be a some form of an asset to the community um, for letting visitors enjoy Manitou and Klein in those areas. Um, I run a kind of a tight ship, so I'm pretty particular. You know, it, it is my home. It's where I reside. I, I, uh, it's my home base. So um, I'm, I do in the winter time, I do some winter sports, snowmobiling and skiing. And so there could be some weekends where I'd rent it out or if I go travel a little bit. And that was my thought behind the asking for the STR. Thanks. Uh, any questions for the applicant? Hi. Hi. Um, just to, so you you you're registered to vote in Manitou, and that's your primary address, and all your cars are registered there and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I get the parking permit, um, Colorado license plate. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Um, sir, um, part of the application materials, there was a Airbnb listing. Was that the proposed listing for this? Yeah, we we um the the Airbnb listing, yeah, that's our start. And I think on the Airbnb listing, it didn't let us change like to one bedroom. Um, because the the property manager, which is here locally thought well what if two men come and i was like well i don't know you know like trying to match up with the parking regulations so but we can put in a description something or i guess what i'm getting at, i just want to clarify so your request is to rent out one bedroom not two bedrooms one bedroom correct okay and so even if there was this scenario where two persons came unrelated they would still stay in one room or, or no, they're going to have two red. I'm not going to occupy it so they can have the whole house. Okay. I, mean, I was curious why not advertise it as two bedrooms for this packet. Cause you said you were only using one. Yeah. That. Oh, I know, but I just, yeah, that, that was a little bit of like, I asked about that too. I said, how can we change that? Um, and the, the property manager mess, well, what if it's two, two men? or two women traveling together on business. Okay. Sorry, do you mind if I interject? Yeah, uh, yeah Commissioner sure. Wilson? Yeah. So I, I did provide guidance to the applicant that uh, strict adherence to the parking calculations would limit it to one bedroom. Um, so even though the house has two bedrooms, in order to stay in, in agreement and in line with the, the STR guidelines, I provided that guidance to the applicant. Um, Certainly, there are extenuating circumstances that can't necessarily be regulated for, um, but that's that's where that discrepancy comes from. Thank you. Appreciate that. It sounds as though you would be renting two bedrooms in some times. Is that correct? Because the li listing um, draft says two bedrooms, two baths. The Airbnb? Yes, I'm, yeah. not, I'm sorry, two bedrooms, two beds, one and a half baths. So are, are you saying that sometimes you would be renting both bedrooms? Well, I don't, I'd be renting to two people, but if there was two people that were unrelated, then they I don't expect them to sleep together. Okay, that kind of begs the issue that we just had. Your application is for one bedroom. Yes. But you're saying you would rent both bedrooms. Um, so I, I guess I could, yeah. I mean, they would, I'm renting one, one room, one thing, but if I'm not quite sure how I would control it to rent just to a couple only all the time.
I'm, I'm just saying your application is different than your listing is. Yeah. I think you'd have to say that you have one bedroom, one bed to rent. That's the only way you could be yeah. in compliance if I understand the issue. It seems to me that you're renting your house. And that this is a this is a non-issue. I don't I don't know why we're taking time to talk about this. Because of the parking issue, they can only have one car. So if he advertises two bedrooms, it's out of compliance with our short-term rental policy. If you have one car, you can still use the kitchen and uh, both bedrooms and. Uh, the playroom. I mean, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's basically it's one car is what we're taking it down to. It's the way the code's written for short term rental. So if he only has a one car garage, he can't advertise he has more than one bedroom to rent because it's out of compliance. Yeah, I think that's that's the main issue is what our code says, and it's it's very um, arbitrary. Each bedroom can assume a vehicle. And so, you know, we can't know what goes on inside the house. I mean, two unrelated people could show up and one could sleep on the couch or whatever. So I, I agree, David, that in a way we're, you know, it, it's, it's more a matter of semantics, maybe how the ad should be worded to... I'm happy to change that. I think that's what the commission is asking. If yeah. we could just and and you yeah. you know you could maybe have guidance with your manager that they could explain to someone. And I did ask the property manager that same question, so it wouldn't create a conflict or any confusion. And I think we can sort it out, or she can sort. I mean, I can ask. We'll I'll make it happen yeah. to sort it out. But their concern was more for them the marketing part i guess yeah. for yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that's why i'm i'll do what you guys yeah. say okay I, i'm just curious along the the notion of the parking place when you're in alaska for two months where do you store your vehicle um i keep it i got two more other properties in colorado okay yeah. okay okay thanks any more questions before we leave? steve have you discussed this with your neighbors? Uh, yeah. Um, I have two neighbors that are actually right next to me. One of them sent in the uh, letter. Yeah. And this is my other neighbor. <laughs> and that, that, and that, otherwise, there's really a church across the street and another neighbor that's over, you know, here and for any type of um, noise or anything, or nuisance, I guess. Let me just say, it's great that you talk to, talk to your neighbors first. I'm so happy to hear that. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, um, thanks. So you can sit down now, and if we have more questions, we'll drag you back. Okay, so the public hearing is open now. If the public comment portion of the hearing, if anybody would like to comment on it, now would be the time. And I'll start by stating your name and address for the record. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Ronan Eidolon. I live at 215 Ruxton, which is just to the east of uh, 223. Uh, I'm in, in favor of this. I've got a driveway with two spots, so if it ever does become an issue, like they can just borrow one of my spots. So, but otherwise, yeah, I don't think this is going to be an issue at all. We're, we're the, if you go back to the plat, we're the only other house in the red. So we, we kind of wanted it. Uh, my wife and I have been talking about doing the SDR, but Patrick got to it first. So I was like, good for you. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anybody online that would be? Uh, there are no individuals online. Okay, then with that, we'll close the public comment portion of the hearing.
I would be inclined to move to approve this just with the recommendation that uh, the ad reads one bedroom, one bath for rental. Okay, we have a motion. Anybody like? Does it have a bath and a half? Is that? Did I? How many baths? Okay. Oh. Well, so just bath and a half. Well, you can have one in half bath. Right. Yeah. Right. You can say. Yeah. So I just don't want to make him change the listing to one bath when there's a bath and a half. Right. That's all. <laughs> I move approval of short-term rental permit two two three at oh. two two three Ruxton Avenue, as set forth in City Code Section eighteen point oh six point four point five, with no conditions. Oh wait. Um... Excuse me. With with the condition that the listing is um, adjusted to one bedroom, one and a half baths. Okay, and so that's overriding your motion to. Did you move? No. Yeah. Okay. And and is there is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. If there's any no more discussion, we can vote. All those in favor. Okay. That's a amazing feat. A yeah. unanimous vote for a short term rental. Yeah. No. We should mark this in history. I think. But <laughs> it, could I make a just a passing comment? Where these two homes are is the original entrance to the Red Mountain Incline. When I first came to town, there was nothing but an old set of stairs, rickety stairs that went up to the top of the cliff. And that's where you caught the coal car that pulled you up to the top of Red Mountain. I had no idea. Amazing. There's yeah, go to the historic society. So go to the Manitou that. Springs Heritage Center. Yeah. You could no, I I'm the president. Um <laughs> you can actually call and talk to the archivists. There's an, a number for them, and they would be thrilled to show you all sorts of info. Okay, so congratulations, and we're done. Now we'll move on to other business. First item is annual board elections. So I'll open the nominations for chair. I nominate Alan Delwich as chair. Okay, I'll accept that or any other nominations. I was gonna second that one. Okay, okay. So if there are no other nominations, then we can vote all those in favor. Okay, well, thank you. And I'll move on then um, for uh, the vice chair, uh, co chair. I'd like to nominate Mike Casey as vice chair. Okay, I'll second that. Any other nominations? And uh, all those in favor? Okay, so we're past that. Uh, Item two is legal training. Uh, thank you, Chair Delwich. For the record, Hannah Van Nimwegen. Uh, I want to introduce our new uh, city attorney for the City Planning Commission. This is Ellie. We're going to get her a name tag. We just haven't had a chance to make it yet. Uh, she'll be giving the uh, legal training tonight, so give me just a moment to get that pulled up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ellie Laboon. I'm from Hoffman Parker, Wilson Carberry. So I know you were previously working with Austin Flanagan. He's still with the firm. So I'll be working with him as we transition. I'm um, just kind of shifting some responsibilities around. Um, and I'm happy to be here tonight. I, fun fact, majored in city planning in college. So full circle moment for me. Yeah. So this is an interest area of mine. So I'm very happy to be here. with the board. So thanks for having me. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have it pulled up. I'll pull up my copy. Um, so this should be um, a quick training, hopefully not new information, um, and there'll be time for questions at the end, but if you have questions while I'm presenting, feel free to interject. Um, next slide, just a quick overview. Um, we'll go over the purpose of the planning commission, the scope of your authority, some general considerations, 
a quick discussion about legislative versus quasi-judicial versus administrative authority, open records and open meetings, executive sessions, conflicts of interest, and governmental immunity and personal liability. So first, the purpose of the Europe Planning Commission, as you know, um, it's set out in your municipal code. It's guiding and accomplishing a coordinated, well-adjusted, and harmonious development, development of the city and its environment. So in accordance with present and future needs, the Planning Commission will make plans that best promote the health, safety, morals, order, and economy in the process of development, including, um, among other things, adequate provision for traffic, beautification, promotion of safety from fire and other dangers, adequate provisions of light and air, the, the promotion of a healthful and convenient distribution of the population, the promotion of good civic divine, design and arrangement, and efficient expenditures of public funds, and the adequate provision of public utilities and other public requirements. So just a few responsibilities there for the purpose of your commission. Moving on to the scope of your authority, um, you have advisory or administrative, legislative and quasi-judicial authority. Your powers and duties are set forth again in your code. This includes creation of a comprehensive plan. Um, your authority is granted by city council over land use recommendations and decisions. And then title 18 is where the money is. Um, that's specifically list the types of applications which the planning commission has the authority to recommend and decide. Okay, so I'll spend a little bit, if we wanna go, sorry, to, yeah, perfect, thanks. I'll spend a little bit more time for the three, oops, sorry, three different types of, um, I guess, decision-making areas, if you will, quasi-judicial, legislative, and administrative, so quasi-judicial, I took six years of Latin, so forgive me for a moment while I indulge. Quasi meaning like and judicial meaning pertaining to judgment, such as the decisions. Okay. Okay, that's better. So quasi-judicial um, pertaining to judgment, the decisions a judge makes in a courtroom, that's kind of exactly what that word means. So when we're thinking quasi-judicial, we're thinking of what just happened in this room. It's a specific decision for a specific applicant. Um, it's a discrete act relating to a single item. You're acting like a judge on a specific application or a single specific um, planning item. So you're ruling on one specific case like a judge does in a courtroom. Um, I know we mentioned this kind of at the beginning of that application hearing, ex parte communications um, are forbidden during quasi-judicial hearings. So ex parte means literally out of the party communications or um, communications about a quasi-judicial matter outside of the presence of the applicant. So if Mr. O'Neill, I think was his name, if you saw him walking down the street and he wanted to talk to you about his short-term rental application before this evening, that would be something that would be an ex parte communication that could result in um, one of the members needing to recuse themselves if that happened. Um, hopefully it doesn't. I know it's a small city um, and you can you know, politely say, you know, excuse me, I am on the planning commission. I actually can't talk to you about this, but I look forward to hearing about your application at our next meeting, whatever it is. Um, it obviously, it can't be avoided at all times, but we wanna avoid it if we can. Um, so going back to quasi-judicial decisions overall, you're applying specific criteria to evidence presented at the public hearing. Um, you must be fair and impartial, no bias, and this is subject to judicial review. Um, I believe I skipped over due process being triggered. So notice an opportunity be, to be heard and you as the commission being the neutral decision maker. Um, and I'll emphasize again, um, the application of criteria um, in a fair and impartial manner at a public hearing. So um, we have a lot of other clients where I've seen discussions can kind of, especially if you know your neighbors or you maybe have walked by this house before, or you've seen a Mr. O'Neill, I'm just using him as an example because he was just here and this is my first time here. So um, just keeping it to the criteria, not bringing in maybe personal experience or um, th 
things outside of the room, outside of the application, that's the best way to keep a quasi-judicial decision on track. Um, if you have any questions about that, always happy to talk further about it. I've just seen sometimes, and obviously not naming names, we have many clients at our firm, but it can easily um, kind of go down a different path if you're not keeping your eye on the ball of the application. But that was a perfect example of a unanimous decision. So it seems like this commission doesn't have an issue with that. Um, Legislator. May I ask a question oh, sure. about that? So if um, if one of his neighbors wanted to speak to us, knows us in, in advance of the meeting and we knew it was going to be on the agenda, what would you recommend we say to them? I'd like to say it verbatim. Yeah, that's a great question. I would say you can recommend that they submit a public comment ahead of time or they come to the meeting and speak in person on the record about the application. Great question. Any other questions about quasi-judicial actions? That's a lot of, I think, what you see as a planning commission. Um, so that's kind of why I'm spending a little bit more time on that. Um, but legislative decisions are also very important. Thinking of legislative decisions like you think of um, the Colorado House. Um, so making general big decisions like passing a bill um, but obviously at the local level here, um, public policy actions. So you're creating a comprehensive plan, zoning regulations, not applying specific criteria to a certain application. Um, so these have a wider impact. You're not looking at one property or one applicant. You're making a decision that affects a whole zone of the city. And then administrative, that would be day-to-day -day activity, such as representing the city, Generally speaking, maybe you're making a decision about something that's going to appear on a, a, your future agenda. Um, those are more kind of base level tasks of any commission, any board, um, you know, receiving emails, reviewing your agenda ahead of time. Those are administrative things that kind of just go, on, go along with being a member of the commission. Um, or if you ever have to change the date of a meeting, something like that. And for all of these, um, at the bottom, it says no fraud, which we'll talk about at the end, um, kind of how you're covered with governmental immunity as well. Any questions about any of those three areas? Okay, so moving on to open records. Um, this is the Colorado Open Records Act. So it's codified under Title 24. Um, so we call this CORA for short. Um, so long story short, um, Everything in here, as you know, is a public record. We're being recorded right now. Um, public records also must be open to public in inspection. So public records include all writings may made, maintained, or kept by a public body, which are used by the body to con conduct functions pursuant to law, administrative rule, or involving public funds. Public records include the correspondence of elected officials, except to the extent that the correspondence is work product, which is communication for the purpose of assisting elected, official, elected officials in reaching a decision within the scope of their authority. So while there are some excep exceptions, I like to think of this as applying to anything you do as a member of the commission, any email you send, um, anything you say in a meeting, anything um, that has to do with being a commission member. Um, so I, we like to say, think twice, hit send once, um, if you don't want it published in the Gazette or requested by um, a, an involved citizen uh, that could be then published or broadcast on Facebook, if if it's, you know, because it, it could be something that's related to the commission, they could get something out of the public record that isn't quite business related. Um, so when someone makes a core request and we deal with these all the time, we will pull a bunch of emails from your files and they may have some things related, some things not. Some core requests are very broad and may pull every single email you've ever sent as a commission member. Some things are very specific and might just be for a single application, any emails that were sent about that application. Um, but just keep it in mind. And if you ever have any questions about it or you wonder if something that you sent or wrote about, talked about uh, in a public meeting is a public record, um, just let me know, happy to help. But I would say, when in doubt, consider it a public record. Ellie, I have one, one more. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, if, if I have a question for a staff person, 
that is subject to open records. Like by e yes. send an email with with a question yes. to staff. So like all of your emails um, as city staff are subject to Quora as well. Yeah. That's what it. if I make a phone call? So a phone call, technically yes, but unless we're pulling, that would be a lot harder to get. And I personally haven't seen that to pull um, a phone record because um, that's typically not something that is recorded. Um, I'm sure it is possible some way to get a copy of that, but that would probably be beyond the scope of what we'd see here in the city. So a phone call, yeah, if you if you have a question, you don't want it to be in writing, not that I'm recommending that you have questions that you wouldn't want to be in writing, but yeah, pick up the phone and make a quick call. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, similar to open records, we have open meetings, which is what we are in right now, um, governed by the Colorado Open Meetings Law, also codified in Title 24. We need um, proper notice for a public meeting, um, and meeting, public meetings require a quorum of three or more members and may only be held after, after at least 24 hours notice. Um, so if there are any changes to the agenda, usually those just need to be um, within that 24 hour or outside of that 24 hour window to comply with open meetings. Um, so going along with open meetings, I would just suggest um, saving substantive discussions for your meetings. There's usually no need to confer all of you on one email chain. We typically advise against that because um, if it's three or more of you on one email chain, we could see that as a quorum. Even though it's happening over email, technically it's a quorum which could violate the open meetings law. Um, same thing goes, at, you know, when we leave here tonight, if three or more of you are kind of congregating outside the building, that could be seen as a violation of op the open meetings law because we're not, we wouldn't be in the meeting anymore if we're standing outside the building, but three of you are kind of chit chatting. Um, which obviously it happens. It's okay. It's not like the, you know, there's someone in the bushes that's always watching over you, but just kind of keep it in mind. If, you know, it happens that all of you are at the grocery store at the exact same time in the exact same aisle. Okay. That that's a little weird. Probably is not going to happen, but, um, try to be all together only when we're in the open meeting. Does that make sense? And just one thing. Yeah. Uh, and if you foresee that there will be three or more members at any particular event, if it's a small town, I'm sure it happens, just let me know and we can get it posted appropriately. Yeah, that's a great point. That's not to say you can't all be together outside of this room, but yeah, maybe we just go the extra length. Yeah. So let's say several of us play pickleball. Yeah. So, and we know that we play, you know, Monday mornings at eight and there's four that uh, do you need to post a pickleball meetup to be on the safe side probably um we can talk about it after the meeting um but technically i would recommend yes i know it seems kind of silly um and obviously you're not you know probably talking about planning commission matters while you're enjoying your pickleball um but that's something maybe we think about and see if it's necessary yeah well, if you don't talk about planning commission business. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the appearance, though, of the impropriety of, you know, having um, three or more individuals. I understand. It, it does seem kind of ridiculous, right? But you just said still. It is. Yeah, it, it is. But but we have to go by the letter of the law, and it's the appearance of there's three or more of you, which does constitute a quorum. Um, so we're try just trying to stick with what the law says, um, not to say that you shouldn't play pickleball and enjoy your regular lives. You don't need to be, you know, changing what you do. Um, if it is a regular occurrence though, that might be, you know, if it's a chance meeting, that's one thing. If it's a regular occurrence, okay, maybe that's something we consider posting and I'm happy to look into that. Um, it is, it's a small city, so I know it happens. I know it happens. Um, that's fun that you're playing pickleball, so. <laughs> okay <laughs> no I'm not suggesting that at all well yeah we'll get it figured out it might not be that you know if if you're in the same if there's I don't know how many pickleball courts you have but if you're you have one okay well you know if you're 
not on the same team, if you're kind of there, but you're not really, you're not to get playing together, you're not congregating, having a full conversation that might not be considered. So I would need to look at kind of probably some subsections of what would be considered a meeting because you're not meeting if you're you're over here and you're over here, really, right? So I'll, I'll look into that. I would say it seems kind of silly, right? We can use common sense too, but sometimes the law is a little bit. Yeah, well, I think that strict. the common sense is the key there because there's many meetings in Manitou Springs where a quorum of city council would be present. It's mm -hmm. not a city council meeting, a quorum of planning commission. Or mm -hmm. And it, yeah. yeah, and it really, do, it doesn't become an issue unless... Um, there's that discussion component that you mentioned, you know, so if, and if there's something contentious going on in the city that people are going to be concerned that you're meeting outside of the, your public meeting. So it's, it's, it becomes an issue when it becomes an issue. And otherwise, you know, no one's going to probably even put it together. Like, Hey, the three or four of you are on planning commission. Hey, the three or four of you are on council. So it doesn't, that that's another component of it too. So it doesn't become an issue unless, you know, there's, let's say we have an application that is contentious and people might then start paying more attention. And that's when we have to make sure that we're paying attention to this. So that, that's why I raise it now, but it doesn't sound like it's been an issue. So yeah, I'm not suggesting you need to change anything, but just something to keep in mind, um, maybe in the future. Okay. Um, executive sessions. So this is also governed by the open meetings law and it's um, somewhat of an exception to the open meetings law. So um, the general rule is that meetings must be open to the public. Um, executive sessions are planned in advance um, periods during a meeting. Um, and it has to be for one of the several reasons that are listed in the law. And the executive session has to be posted with the specific reason why you will be having the executive session. So this would be the time to discuss more sensitive information or receive legal advice. Most executive sessions are still recorded for just in case purposes, but they won't be posted online. Um, and the discussions themselves would be closed to the public. So it would just be the commission and usually staff would exit as well. And if you need legal advice, then myself or the attorney would stay. Um, and yeah, the only other thing, they can't be a spur of the moment decision, just like anything else on the agenda, they would be planned in advance. And there's several different reasons that we would list. Um, and there's ways to, depending on the sensitivity of whatever you're discussing, there's ways to get it on the agenda that um, notifies the public of the general topic without maybe disclosing more of the sensitive information. Or if it's um, just pertaining to legal advice on a specific topic, um, that's one of the exceptions for an executive session as well. Do you have any questions? Okay. Conflicts of interest. So this is governed um, in the Colorado Constitution, the Colorado Code of Ethics, um, and in statute, and in criminal code, and in the Manitou Springs Municipal Code. So lots of overlapping um, regulations on this one. But generally speaking, you cannot perform an act affecting your economic interest or a family member's interest. So there are some steps that we have to avoid a conflict of interest, which would be disclosing the interest, if necessary, recusing yourself and leaving the room. Um, only if it's necessary though, otherwise um, you only recuse or abstain for a valid reason. Um, and this is so your conflict of interest does not influence the decision in that matter. Um, if you ever have any questions about whether something is a conflict of interest or um, if it needs to be disclosed, I'm happy to discuss that with you ahead of time um, to determine if it's actually a conflict of interest and whether you, you should plan to recuse yourself during the meeting. Any questions? Okay. Finally, we have governmental immunity and personal liability. So boards and members have immunity under the Colorado Governmental Immunity Act unless you act willful, willfully or wantonly or individual members act outside the scope of their authority. So in most cases, you are not personally liable for anything that occurs as part of your role on planning commission, as long as you're not kind of outside the scope of your authority, acting willful, willfully or wantonly. So this is where I will come in. You'll stay within the scope of your authority, and hopefully this will never be an issue. 
um, you know, just use your best judgment. And when it's out, please feel free to come to me with any questions if you think this could ever be an issue, but hopefully it's not. That's all I have for you. Any questions? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, just one curious, six years of Latin? Yes, it's one of my life regrets. <laughs> I wish I had taken Spanish, but it did help me, you know, testing along the way. So yeah, yeah. that's a fun fact. Yeah. Um, any council action and updates? Um, just a couple of uh, quick updates from staff. Uh, so first, we are looking into, uh, if you remember at the last planning commission meeting, there was an individual who spoke in opposition to one of the applications saying that there was like 60 plus uh, short term rental advertisements on Airbnb v VRBO. Um, we are looking into those um, items and we'll prepare like a, an actual list of what is actually being advertised. What we have found is that several of them are listings for hotel units, which don't have to abide by our short-term rental code. So that could be the discrepancy between the number that that individual was seeing and um, the number that we're actually regulating. But we'll pull together those final um, details and share it with you. Also, I just wanted to let the commission know that we are scheduling a neighborhood meeting for an upcoming application. Uh, it's related to Garden of the Gods trading post. I don't want to interfere with any quasi-judicial nature, but the application would eventually come before the city planning commission. So if any of your neighbors happen to approach you uh, about this potential project, please direct them to staff and we'll give them details from there. And that is. Hannah, may I say something about my neighbors? I live on Becker's Lane. My neighbors, some have received a little flyer that indicates they sh that it's going before the Colorado Springs Planning mm -hmm. Commission, that there won't be a public meeting, but comments by January 18th. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense with what you know? It does in that um, the application or that property splits the city's jurisdictional line. So part of the scope of the work is actually happening in the city of Colorado Springs jurisdiction. What we're reviewing is the site as a whole. So what you would eventually see would be a holistic review. Um, but neighbors, I encourage them to participate in both processes. And just to chime in as well, um, I am... Uh, collaborating with the planner that is assigned from Colorado Springs. So she and I are in communication about um, public hearings and uh, neighborhood meetings, and we're sharing that information across uh, folks who contact either of us. Is it possible for the decisions of the Colorado Springs Planning Department uh, to be made before our public meeting in February? Uh, it's very unlikely before the uh, neighborhood meeting in February. Okay. Anybody have anything else? Okay, then we're adjourned. <laughs>